Hey, and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. And today, we're looking at Season 6's Halloween episode, The Koi Pond. Did you say Koi Pond? Okay, we have a ton of stuff to unpack here. We have the censored cold opening. We have the greatest deleted scene that I think I've ever seen. Go, go, go. And we have a lot of background stuff and hidden goodies here. So without further ado, let's get to it. Warning, 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 ah. warning. I understand nothing. All right, so the brief for this one, the cold opening. Michael gloats about Jim having the customer request Michael's presence at the sales meeting. Why don't they just want you to go by yourself? Why do they want me to come too? I don't understand. I absolutely don't understand either. The sales meeting occurs off screen, but Michael comes back drenched and we find out it's because he's fallen into the lobby's koi pond. It was, okay, this is what it was. It was these bunch of idiots that had put a fish tank in the ground with no cover and no railing. And the rest of the episode is just fallout from that one event. The B-plot is Pam and Andy's cold calling thing in person. WB. Industrial Park. Industrial P. And they're doing that because they are the lowest performing salespeople in the branch, in spite of what Kelly's board said last week. And that's our first hidden goodie for this episode. If office goodies are your thing, then you might want to check out Culture Fly's office themed box. Honestly, I signed up for this about a year ago, just looking for extra swag I could give out during live streams. And I've been really impressed with some of the quality and deep references that the items are based on. Sure, they have basic things like the stapler and the jello plushie and the foam dunder Mifflin box, but they have some pretty delightfully deep cut reference stuff. It's clearly put together by fans of the show and the boxes themselves have some great artwork. It's like Christmas every single time, you know, a new box come in. So if you follow the link in the description, it supports the channel if you purchase a box. And if you use a discount code Mulverine at checkout, you get 20% off your first box. If you go in there with $645, you are literally a king. Supports the channel, gets you a discount, and at the end of the day, you're getting a butt ton of office swag sent to you every few months. Treat yourself or makes for an awesome gift you know, during the holidays. I'm glad! What would you like for Christmas, little Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> but back to the B-plot, the platonic couple reject perceptions and assumptions about them being a couple a couple of times. Do you guys know the sex yet? Oh, no, no. <laughs> We're not together. No, no. Since we are a family business, it's nice to see that you are too. Oh, wow. <laughs> until they finally embrace it. Wow. Oh. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. In that B-plot again, we get a little bit more of this animosity between Pam and Aaron. She's like, she's kind of cool. Yeah. And in a big, long, full circle, Pam's kind of in the same place she was back in season three, talking to Andy about his love interest. I don't know if I really see you two together. Really? Well, maybe you should look in the smart part of your brain. Not exactly the same, but you get it. She doesn't really like Andy. Sweet photo one. But she's also got that weird energy going with Aaron. So she's answering this question as honestly as she can, I'm sure. You think I can do better? Yeah. Let's go back and spend a little time with the cold opening. All right. All right. Let me go get your stroller. Yeah, not that one. So there's a lot here, stick with me. When this episode aired back in October 2009, it was The Office's Halloween episode for season six. But viewing it today on all the streaming platforms, all you could find in this episode to suggest that it's a Halloween episode is Stanley's super sweet sweater rather than his normal suit jacket thing. Any chance Connecticut casuals Pennsylvania business, i.e. this is what I'm wearing to your party. Suggesting it's a cozy fall time. I think it's the most contemplative of seasons. This is important though because the episode itself has nothing to do with Halloween, but marketing as a Halloween episode will always get a bump in viewership. At least that's what I'm hoping. So unless you're watching the episode the night it aired, like I was, and probably some of you, uh, or you know you had a DVR or something, I, I don't know why, but I kind of miss DVR. Streaming's way more convenient, but there's just something to DVR in it. Maybe I should get a TiVo. Anyway, the original cold opening for this episode was not this. Instead, it was a much more controversial cold opening that was aired. I've been censored. 
So a lot of prefacing here. Before I get into it too much, I'll start with why the sequence has been censored in the first place. The primary reason that it was cut was due to the manner in which the opening handled the topic of suicide. This can be a really difficult topic for some for a variety of reasons. I've in fact lost a few friends to suicide in my life, so I'm gonna handle this with as much sensitivity as I can. If you're not comfortable with any of this, skip to this timestamp in the video and I'm sure we'll be talking about something awesome. Okay, so the original cold opening. If you haven't seen it and you'd like to, you can check out the links in the description. You can go watch the entire thing. You can actually find it pretty easily now as it was quietly added to the NBC website back in 2017 and a Halloween edit that the official Office YouTube channel posted that same year. It's interesting to me because immediately after airing in 09, NBC removed it from everywhere. The reruns, the DVDs, the streaming platforms entirely. Just to later go release it on YouTube. Anything new on YouTube? Michael. Doesn't even need to be good. Right, it's kind of odd, but we'll get to that in a minute. This cold opening has Michael and the gang holding a haunted house in the warehouse. Here is an old man and a goth dude and in the old crone from Drag Me to Hell. I'm a hobo. I asked for a list. Just for fun, let's dive through everyone's costume real quick. Jim is... Bookface over there. Yes, I am the popular social networking site known as Bookface. And I'll actually give him a little bit of credit here. This is a pretty low effort costume on the surface but it would entirely suck to wear. Having paint on your face when you're not used to it, especially is super uncomfortable and you have to contend with smudging or sweating it off. Props to Jim for this, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Then we've got Creed as a Christopher Lee inspired Dracula, I think. I want to sell your blood. It's really not the trend of vampires right now. And then I guess Ryan is Edward Cullen. And also this clip might answer why Creed stole the blood from the van in the Blood Drive episode. Pam's the mom from Rosemary's Baby. Angela, Kelly, and Meredith all self-describe. Black Widow, Lilu from The Fifth Element. I'm a hobo. Daryl is a pumpkin. Gangster pumpkin. Kevin, I think, is Paul Blart. Andy's dressed up like Michael Jackson from Thriller, but he looks a lot more like Alan Covert from The Wedding Singer. Last Halloween, I came as Janet Jackson's boob. Phyllis is a witch or a scientist, or like a witch scientist. Stanley's the bored victim. Michael's Justin Timberlake from in a box. Dwight is Billy the Puppet from Saw. I'm Jigsaw, idiot. And Moses is there, though he doesn't do anything. I love it. So the controversy. Michael, in all his wisdom, decides that Halloween is a time to give a message. Why is Christmas the only holiday that can have a message? He's decided that the best way to do this is to rig up a harness and pretend to hang himself. In universe, this is really stupid. Not just because it's probably not the conversation that these parents wanted to have with their kids on the way home from the haunted house, but also because, you know, Michael probably rigged this thing up himself and we know he's pretty prone to accidents. Go, go, go. It's incredibly dangerous to do something like that. But in real life, the outcry after this episode aired was apparently big enough to warrant NBC from pulling it from the surface of the earth and locking it into a vault until the distant future of 2017. We'd all evolved so far past the point of getting offended and outraged by humor. And in completely unrelated news, Diversity Day has been removed from the Comedy Central lineup. You would maybe not be a very good driver. Oh man, am I a woman? In all seriousness, I know the scene is probably jarring and it definitely makes me put my hand over my face in cringe and confusion. And he does follow it up with a brief message. Kids, just remember, suicide is never the answer. And like many things the office tries to tackle using humor, like sexual harassment. No, oh. Oh. It's too far. Racism. Some alien ass oh, no. I take care of my kids. Wait, wait, wait. And Orphanages. Okay. Okay. You, know what? you know what? Suicide is a taboo topic that gets pushed aside. It's extremely difficult to talk about, much less joke about. Again, like everything, we have to look at the intention of the joke, and here it's clear that Michael's lesson was a good thing, but stupid in practice. What the hell is wrong with you? Who wants candy? The joke is how dumb it was trying to teach a good lesson. 
kind of like Diversity Day. You'll notice I didn't have anybody be an Arab. I thought that would be too explosive. Anyway, like I said, I have lost friends to it in the past. So if you're watching this and you've considered it or are considering it, please consider getting some help. You're not alone. And I'll have some resources for this in the description. And if you have kids, read up on the right time to talk to your kids about that kind of stuff. These parents probably didn't want to have the conversation with their kids that night, but what parent ever wants to have that conversation with the kids? I know my parents awkwardly suffered through that when I was little, and I awkwardly suffered through it when my kids were little. I'll leave some links in the description for those kind of conversations too, if you're interested in that. Okay, the serious stuff is over. Apparently a koi has died. When is the funeral? Do not mock. <laughs> right, so the koi pond. Let's tackle this from a few different angles. The first angle is one that we never saw in the original cut, which is the extended security tape. Here's as much as YouTube will allow me to show you. Truthfully, it wasn't the way he fell in. It was how long it took him to get out. And it's great and all its glory, link will be in the description. It's so weird that that was actually cut from the episode. I think it would have made for a really good stinger. <laughs> Way better than the Pam Aaron awkwardness stinger that we get. He's like Marlon Brando. Oh, do you mean Marlon Wayans? Because he is. I actually do mean Marlon Wayans, yeah. But the next angle we have to look at the Koi Pond thing from is how everyone gets angry at Jim. Hey, what's up, lifeguard? Jim, I think I'm in your way. <laughs> and as you guys know, I really like to overanalyze stuff. Jim's really not the one that we should be angry at. It's the designers that they're selling the paper to. Michael, you know, when you think about it, it's not all your fault. I mean, who puts a koi pond in a lobby? They put a stupid koi pond in the middle of their lobby. This cannot be up to code. There's no handrails, and it's a weird angled path. According to the interview that Andy Green had in his book, Carell actually did the stunt himself, and he had to do it more than once. He was drying off in between takes, and he asked the lead writers of this episode if this bit was even believable. Would anybody be that stupid? At which point, Warren Lieberstein said that this actually happened to him and his writing partner, Halstead Sullivan, when they were walking through an office lobby once, which is a pretty great story. And you know they were just sitting on that for quite a while. Like, when can we get Michael to fall into a koi pond? Can you kick me out of the meeting now? Go. No. Go. But the last angle that I think we need to look at this from is really, what was Jim supposed to do here? Go! 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 You could see that he's walking with his right hand, covering up his peripheral vision, when all of a sudden Michael's motion starts to get out of control. He sways away from Michael's flailing arm, I mean, if he's super reactionary, like split second, and he sees Michael lose balance, I guess he could possibly put his arm on Michael's shoulder to help keep him stable. But we're talking like Jackie Chan levels of reaction time and ability. Jackie Chan! And Jim's just not that guy. Oh. It was much more likely that by the time Jim made that pullback motion, if he tried to save Michael, he'd have definitely got in as well. Wet tuna. He'd still look good. So, sad to say, but this is forced drama. I don't want a drama. It's the kind of thing that sounds good on paper when you hastily write it down. We are selling success. And paper. That's sort of secondary. But to actually pull it off in a believable way is extremely difficult. Jim couldn't have saved Michael, meaning there wouldn't have been any reason for people to get upset with him and thus getting Dwight one step closer to his master plan. Jim is my enemy, but it turns out that Jim is also his own worst enemy. And the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Jim is actually my friend, but. The logic trap that Dwight found himself in there though is great. Fun fact, a lot of characters change their background to koi ponds in this episode. And Andy's fish aquarium thing is on, even though he's not there. And then we have this sensitivity training stuff in the conference room, led by Michael Scott. Asking people to call out what they don't want to be made fun of for is definitely giving me healthcare vibes. I'm not going to read aloud your submitted medical conditions. When you hear yours read, please raise your hand to indicate that it is real. If you do not raise your hand, it will not be covered. Inverted penis. Dwight's insecure about his nose. It's too small. Did you sneeze it off? Ryan's insecure about his relationship with Kelly. Just put Kelly. Aww. Kevin's insecure about his weight. I don't want people making fun of my weight. 
How about your stomach? Yum? And for a little background here, if you hadn't seen this deleted scene, it's not my job to write up your expense report. Here's context on Meredith's insecurity. Do it, or I'll punch you like a football. Could you mean vagina? Oh, is that what you did with that Al-Qaeda guy in bed? He wasn't an Al-Qaeda guy. He just wanted Puerto Rico to become a state. But Michael writes Shrimpy for Angela, and written but not shown is the first mention that Aaron was an orphan, which is probably step one of giving Aaron some depth, but we're gonna get to that in the next episode. Then as we go through the rest of this one, we get Jim's advice. I am a big, stupid goofball. Michael's breakdown. Too far! God! The Koi Pond reveal. Use what? quick time, trust me, I've done this. Guys, oh. he purposefully leaned away and let you fall. And the stinger with Aaron and Pam. Oh sure, oh wait, hand them to me upside down so I don't accidentally read them. You can just barely see it, but Pam's painting is not there during the filming of this episode because Aaron ruined it in the last episode, but that was deleted. But with that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Koi, or in Japanese, Nashikago, have a very interesting history. Koi is Japanese for carp, you just ignore their carping. Carp is both a fish and a term for complaining. These were originally domesticated in East Asia, with it seeming that their ability to be bred for color mutations thousands of years ago is really what gave rise to their popularity. They became really significant in Chinese and Japanese cultural tales, with the most prevalent and simple symbolism being that koi represent good luck and prosperity. The various colors of the fish even began to take their own specific symbolism. The white-bodied with red spot koi symbolized success in your profession. The silver and gold koi represented wealth. A white and red koi with red around its mouth might symbolize love. And I kind of get it. If you've ever been around a koi pond, these fish are pretty fun just to chill with. They're peaceful and their colorization makes them extremely unique and beautiful. Killing one then. I silenced it by killing it. Well, it's probably just as easy to say that that represents quite the opposite of those things. He did not suffer. In this episode, we again get to see our characters living out the choices that they've made. For example, I'd bet money that Pam's thinking throughout this entire day, why did I follow Michael and want to become a salesman? What is the difference between a salesman and a saleswoman? Andy tells us what he's thinking. So sick of being single. And that explains how rapidly he was able to recall information about birthing coaches. Oh, I know the best teacher. Her name's Miss Janet. Yeah, on Clearview Avenue. Yeah. And we know that even though Michael's having some fun with Helene. Oh my God. He's still dreaming about the one who got away. Why do you send her away? That, God. And while he started this episode pretty sure of himself. I don't want you to feel like I'm babysitting you or something. Everything changed when he squished that fish. They said you stepped on its head. It's like he has this realization about who he is and his breakdown in front of the bullpen is just a glimpse at the self-doubt that this dude has. I don't even have Jan's cell phone number, and I hate her. Well, I guess I'm a loser. A loser. While Jim is even faced with all this, I think the writing is supposed to infer that he let Michael fall into the koi pond because he was upset about still being in Michael's shadow. I mean, I may never be as good a salesman as you are, but I at least need the chance to do the job. Dwight and Ryan are not where they want to be either. It's kind of a bleak episode until this moment. Oscar's a douche. <laughs> so Jim's reaffirmed by Michael in an off-brand, low-key, playful kind of way. It's kind of touching, and I had a bigger emotional response to this moment than any clip I've seen in a while. And that's because it's our friends and our loved ones in our lives who may razz us. Hey, um, you're poor. Well, hey, your mama's dead. That's what friends do. May let us down, but those strong bonds can keep us all together and keep us moving on. Whoa! Almost fell. <laughs> but with that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. 
Let's start with the cold opening that was tagged with this episode since day two. I can't believe it's, I can't believe it's yogurt. So you probably know where I'm gonna go with this. This isn't really a cold opening. I don't think they really threw this thing together like post airing it and then just came up with this new bit. Instead, they re-edited this episode together to give it a cold opening and it doesn't hold up as one. In reality, this sequence was probably the original part that played right after the theme song like, like this. And then I think I'm going to go to the garlic festival. As it is, it's kind of a sucky cold opening. That was a really sucky thing to do. And it's one that makes the blind guy McSqueezy cold opening way better. But, you know, I'm gonna give it a one out of five. I'm gonna kill you. And then we're gonna move on to the original cold opening. Join your gangster pumpkin on his pallet truck of doom. I don't exactly know how to rate this one because it's obviously a lot of work from set design, costume design, the stunt work, getting extras, even the camera work is really good. Yes, that probably had something to do with the camera work. I really do wonder if this cold opening would have been on the Netflix airing when it first started streaming and, you know, The Office picked up tons of new fans. Maybe this cold opening might have been one of the most popular cold openings of all time. The punchline of this one tackles a taboo topic in a way that only Michael Scott would, which feels very real and true to the series. I give it a four out of five. Yeah, he's all right. It's definitely marked down a bit because it literally has nothing to do with the episode itself, but you know, the content's good. Who wants candy? But for the episode of Koi Pond, well, let's check the IMDb score. Yeah, it's lower. So this ride continues. I seem to be the opposite of most people on this. I like watching Michael be squeamish. I think the conference room sequence is great. We don't have much of the Helene Michael drama, which is kind of weird, right? You know what, I'm gonna start dating her even harder. What's that supposed to mean? You know what it means. Well, Pam's out of the office, so I guess that adds up. I think this episode's pretty good and it deserves a lot more love than what it gets. Michael Fallon in the Koi Pond is just one bit of this, but it's an office vibe. Everything about it. I'm giving it a three out of five. Is what I want to say, but I won't. Never mind. I'm giving it a four out of five. It's great. You are smart. Jim is smart. You are handsome. But that's just what I think about Koi Pond. What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.